Lindsay. Are you okay? No. I think you need to take me to the hospital. I think uh, <coughs> we should go to Waverly. Oh, of course you do. I'm serious, Lindsay. And I'm serious. I'm not going on that tour. Come on, Lindsay. It'll be fun. No. Come on, let's go. No. Come on. No. Let's go. Bye. Let's go to Waverly. Yay. Hello, hauntlings. My name is Alyssa, and this is my ghoulishly gorgeous wife and co-host, Lindsay. This is Macabre at Midnight, where we rate all things that sit on a scale, starting with the adorably spooky and ending with the truly disturbing. On tonight's episode, we're going to be looking at Waverly Hills Sanitarium. Mm. My favorite thing is that I know if I... um say something and i stop Lindsay's gonna go ooh in some weird way it's never the same <laughs> but she's always gonna do it uh is that a fact it's a fact hmm. i know because i edit these things so yeah tonight we're gonna be looking at waverly hill sanatorium um that one on our poll on instagram so just a few things before we get into waverly hill sanatorium the first thing at the front of the list is you guys may have noticed that our last episode was late. Uh, the reason for that, if you don't follow us on social media, is because we were having some issues with our internet. Yep, yeah, it's it's been all wonky. Yeah, it, I mean, I've lost homework assignments. <laughs> I keep, stuff just keeps getting lost because the internet like freezes up and shuts off, so I'm not real sure what's going on with it. I, I had to work the day after we usually post so i really couldn't stay up any longer and mess with it so if you don't follow us on social media and you ever notice that we haven't posted then it will be up as soon as we can get to it but we do live like right on the edge of town and the country so sometimes the internet gets a little weird mm -hmm. and we're also like in the middle of two hills yeah so when the weather gets bad it uh it's not a good time <laughs> it's not a good time no so yeah uh, if you're not following us on social media for those updates, just know it will be up. We promise. We enjoy bringing you guys content. And we love seeing you guys pop up. We love seeing that you guys listen to us. I'm talking to you, number one. I'm talking to you, Indonesia. I'm talking to you, Canada. And now I'm talking to you, Buffalo, New York. Woo! So, yeah. Just be patient with us. And we always appreciate your patience, guys. I appreciate you. The next thing that I want to talk about is a podcast called Brutal, Bizarre, and Boozy. And let me tell you guys, these guys are so fun. This is a mother-son duo, and they talk about all sorts of creepy things. They're kind of like us. They have their hands in a little bit of everything. Yes. They've got some true crime. They've got some, like, hauntings in there. they got cryptids. Mm. Lindsay's just turned into a Skeksy. I don't know if y'all <laughs> are old enough to know what a Skeksy is or not, but... Lindsay just turned into Chamberlain. But yeah, and the really fun part, it's so funny because when I first listened to them last week and I was in the back of the house at work, I had my headphone in and they start off with a cocktail that kind of correlates with what they're talking about. Ooh, that's nice. Yeah, but I was at work, so no cocktails for me. I should have grabbed one of the barbacks. Give, 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 give. So check them out. Again, that is Brutal, Bizarre, and Boozy Podcast. They are on all of the podcasting platforms. Go give them five stars. Tell them that you like them. Tell them what your favorite episode is. And let them know that we sent you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sharing is caring. Sharing is caring. Speaking of sharing and caring, you may have heard of our listener library. Well, guess what, guys? The lights just flashed again. <laughs> like it's getting they intense up in here. <laughs> we can't do the listener library if you don't submit your stories. So it's coming, guys. I promise. But we haven't had any submissions. We're still a baby podcast. We are yes. still growing. So yes. please, though, if you have stories and or fiction, yeah. send fiction them our way, even if you want to re remain anonymous, just, yeah. just send them our way so they could be broadcasted to everyone who's listening. Yeah. And if you want to remain anonymous, you just tell us, you know, you want to remain anonymous. We want to respect your privacy. Absolutely. While also sharing the spooks. Yeah. So... 
send us your listener library submissions. And as soon as we start getting submissions, guys, we will get them out there. We're not just advertising it to waste your time or our breath. It's just that we want it to be a thing and we don't have anything yet. Yes. So don't be shy now. <laughs> well, come on down. I should be a game show host. <laughs> I was thinking like a, a circus ringmaster. I mean, sure. I'll take that, too. <laughs> oh, my God. You're so fun. Uh, the last thing that I want to mention, and before I mention it, it is so important that you guys keep in mind, we're not sponsored. And just so you guys know, um, the circus master and I slept in extra late tonight so that we could bring you guys all the energy when we recorded because i've noticed when listening to our podcasts and when i'm editing them sometimes we sound like we're dying because we are but we're all dead inside yes we are dead but caffeinated with <laughs> jack top of the morning coffee we are not sponsored but this is the best damn coffee i've ever had in my Hell life guys. yeah it is no lie it is so delicious. We're drinking it right now. So not only are we running on like 13 hours of sleep for you guys, but we are running on Jacksepticeye's coffee. And let me tell you, Lindsay got this for me for Christmas. I know you guys don't care, but there's a coffee drinker out there that cares. Okay. <laughs> I know because I am one. But when I opened this box, it was so aromatic and like pungent in the delicious you just had to, like, smash it in your face and give a big inhale. That's not what I was going to say, but yes. <laughs> just and like that. I did do that. But it the, the smell was so strong that before I even opened it, I could smell it. And it punched me in the face and I became Irish for, like, ten minutes. Hell yeah. So it's good. Guys, drink Jack Septic Eyes coffee. That's top of the morning coffee. Sponsor us, Jack. Please, I'll advertise your coffee all day long. <laughs> I'll make an entire episode about your coffee. But yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and close up this long intro. Sorry, it's been a while since we've recorded, so there is quite a bit of stuff to announce. Yeah. So, uh, But we'll go ahead and get into it. We try not to make our intros more than five minutes long, so if this ran a little over, I'm so sorry. And we will get into Waverly Hills Sanitarium while I sip my top of the morning coffee. I'm ready for it. Hit me with it. Let's get spooky. What is wrong with you? <laughs> I ask myself that daily. Oh, my God. Okay. So, okay. So, we're going to start by defining a sanatorium. And I'm going to ask you the question that we always ask each is other. Is it pronounced sanatorium or sanitarium? Well, if you listen to Metallica, it's sanitarium. I wonder if sanitarium and sanitarium are the same thing. Hold on, I'm gonna look. And we're back. Oh my god, Lindsay, what the hell? You're so good. So, should have been a voice actor. <laughs> so a sanitarium serves people who have a variety of illnesses. Sanatorium specifically serves people with uh, tuberculosis. Oh, okay. Okay. They're for sick people. Yes. And the sanatorium is for people with tuberculosis. Now, I believe sanitariums are like specialty hospitals. Yeah. So they do deal with people who have like a specific illness, but they're not necessarily just for the mentally ill. We clear on that? Yes. Okay. So Waverly Hills is a sanatorium. So we're going to go over the history of Waverly before we get too far into the spookies. The spookies, even though some of the history is pretty, pretty spooky. Is it brutal? It's brutal, but it's not boozy. Waverly Hills was purchased by Major Thomas H. Hayes mm. in the year 1883. Uh, he purchased it. It was to be their family home. Okay, that's interesting. I wonder how it Well, from... okay, okay. He purchased the land. Oh, okay. So yeah. That, okay. It was kind of out of town. So he made one room into a schoolhouse for his children. And he hired the teacher, Miss Lizzie, that might be Harris, Miss Lizzie Harris. Oh, so he was a rich guy. Yeah. And, well, you know, I don't feel like it was hard to get rich in the 1800s. Hmm. 
I guess that depends. So he hires Liz Harris, and she has a fondness for the author Walter Scott's Waverly. And so she actually asks Mr. Hayes if she can, or no, I'm sorry, she got permission from this author to name the school Waverly School. Okay. So she wants to name it Waverly School. And in turn, Mr. Hayes named the property Waverly Hill. Was it on a hill? Uh, yes. Okay. Back then, it was spelt Waverly with an E-Y. It's no longer spelled that way. But that was how they spelt it at the time because it was named after the author. Why is it not spelled that way now? I don't know. Okay. That's the same reason that you don't know why Centralia changed its name from frickin' Bullhead. Is that what it was? Yeah. Bullhead to Centralia. Yeah. So, in the early 20th century, Louisville, Kentucky, had one of the highest rates of tuberculosis in the U.S. Damn. And it is pronounced Louisville. I have lived there. I know. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's For pronounced it. Louisville. For uh, those of you who don't know, it, it, it looks like it's spelled Louisville. That is not it. Or Louisville. It's, it's yeah. Louisville. Yeah. I understand the spelling is situation. I really do, but that, I'm but telling that, you. That is how the locals say it, so that's I'm, how it's said. Right. I'm telling you, if you go there, they're going to tell you that's how it's said. But anyway, so it had one of the highest rates of tuberculosis in the U.S., and at this time, it was actually known as the White Plague. Oh, wow. I didn't know that there was a another name for it. Yeah. So, why was it called the White Plague? I have no idea. Oh, you didn't look into it? No. Hmm, that's interesting. So, this was uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. We're going to talk about the disease itself a little bit before we mm -hmm. get into the history. And pulmonary tuberculosis is caused by the bacterium Mycobacterium tuberculosis, or known as M. tuberculosis. Okay. okay. Uh, this is contagious, and you generally get it by breathing in the air droplets from infected person's cough or sneeze. So if someone were to, like, go, or <laughs> Like, in your face, you'd, you'd probably get it. Oh, yeah, no, you're gonna get it. Ugh. Like, you're gonna get it. But if they're not going Achia! in your face, <laughs> yeah, you can still sit there and talk to them. Okay, you're mm -hmm. not gonna get it from, like, you know, just having a conversation. Right, right. Six feet distance. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, we all know. Social distancing. Everybody knows. Everyone's familiar with that. Right. This causes primary tuberculosis, which can actually remain dormant in the body for years. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. But it can reactivate as well. Okay. So it generally turns up in a person after they've already had it for several years. That sucks so yeah. bad. Yes. Yes, it does. You like you could be like walking around like you don't even know. And then one day you just like start coughing up blood and stuff. And you're like, what the heck? Yeah. I mean, it's not like COVID, where, like, two days after you freaking get it, you feel like you have concrete filling your nose. Oh, yeah, and you lose your taste and smell. I hated that. I was so freaking mad. Ugh. I was, like, living on the stupid nostril spray. You're not supposed to do that, but I couldn't breathe. Yeah, I, I was eating cough drops like they were candies. Yeah, but they, like, they didn't have, they didn't know very quickly that they had it. It could take years. Right. And even in the cases where it came on much sooner than that, it still took a few weeks. That's terrible. And from my understanding of tuberculosis, it was a terminal illness too, right? Like it was, there's, yeah. you, the, you're going to die. Like either way, there's nothing that they can do about it. Yeah. At the time, if you were diagnosed with it, it was a death sentence. Right. People knew that they were going to get it and they could live for years with it. Mm -hmm. There are letters that families wrote to loved ones where they just kind of like they know they're going to die, you know, so like, it's inevitable. Like, yeah, my time is coming, but I'm going to live while I can. Exactly. So let's let's get a little further into tuberculosis. And I just kind of want you all to understand what these people were living with, what the risks were, that sort of thing. The highest and even to this day, those who are at high risk are generally older adults. Infants or people with weakened immune systems. So, so like deja vu. Yeah, no. Generally, you're more susceptible around it, obviously, if you live around people who are more infected. Or if you live in really crowded areas. 
Sounds like any other plague disease out there. Hmm. Right. Wonder what that's like. Uh, apparently, poor nutrition is also something that can make you more susceptible to it. Yeah. I would imagine because good nutrition means you have stronger. You have a stronger system. body, stronger. Right. Yeah. The symptoms include breathing difficulty, hmm. chest pain, coughing, coughing up blood. Yeah. Excessive sweating, particularly at night. Fatigue. Fever, weight loss, and wheezing. Ooh. Some complications include vision change, orange and brown tears or urine. Oh my god. A rash, and inflammation of the liver. See, I didn't know all of that. Like, that sounds awful. I would not. Is that still around today? Can you still get tuberculosis? You can still get tuberculosis today, but it is curable today. It's very difficult to cure. But it is curable and it is preventable. You can, they treat it with antibiotics. Listen, I would rather have COVID 10 times <laughs> than ever get diagnosed with any oh, of that. Yeah. I might not be able to taste anything, but at least I'm not like secreting up blood or secreting orange fluids from my body. <laughs> like, that just sounds unpleasant. That sounds really awful. Yeah. Back to Louisville. Industrialism is up and coming. Which is contributing to the issue because there's not a lot of fresh air. Louisville is in the Ohio Valley, mm -hmm. which means it is down in a valley. So there's not a lot of fresh air going through. Um, again, it's a city, so it's very industrialized. Yep. Lots and lots, and lots of smog. Right. So you It's know, probably worse now than what it was back in the 1800s. Oh, yeah, right? I'm sure. But uh, so because of this, you know, again, we have high, very high rates of tuberculosis. Uh, in Louisville. So in 1906, the Board of Tuberculosis Hospital is established. Okay. Eventually, these guys start looking at the Hayes property to build something for these people. So they're like, hey, you have lots of property that's on a hill. Right. It was far away, it was tranquil, and it wasn't down in the Ohio Valley. There was, like, good airflow. It was, like, up high. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in 1908, they changed the name to Waverly Hills Sanatorium. It took two years to build, and it was finished on July 26th of 1910. And originally, like, when you imagine Waverly Hills, you imagine the large building that it is, right? Yeah. It's a massive structure. But originally, it was small. It was only two stories, and it was able to house about 20 males and 20 females. Okay. But it quickly reached capacity. <laughs> okay. Oh. In March of 1924, they decide that they have to enlarge it. And they go from this little two-story wooden building to a five-story brick structure. Oh, my God. Yes. This new building was done in October of 1926. So did they build that, like, on the property of the house? Yes. Or, but not over the house? No. Okay. I believe they added to it. Oh, they just added to the house? Like yeah. they revert converted the house into this yes, massive structure? I, I believe. I believe. It didn't really elaborate, but if you look at pictures of it, there's not a little wooden two-story house anywhere. Makes sense. So, uh, This new house could hold 400 patients. Dang. Or this new structure, rather. That's a lot. Even with the 400 patients, they were having a very, very difficult time being able to fit everybody in because the numbers were just, they, they were just coming in. Oh, yeah. So, sounds exactly like how it was in COVID, where pe the hospitals were so full, people were in the hallways and whatever, you know. My sister-in-law's fiancé worked for a, uh, what do you work for, a mortuary? Yes. And didn't he say that, like... They were keeping bodies that were infected with COVID in trailers behind the building. Because there were so many of them. Yeah, because the morgue was completely full. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Just like COVID, you know. So they were just brimming. At this point, Waverly becomes self-sustaining because of the situation. So if you're going to go work at Waverly, you're saying bye-bye to your family. Mm -hmm. Okay? You're basically going to... So you work there, you live there. You work there, you live there. They had their Part own... of the ship part of the crew <laughs> <laughs> they had their own laundry mat they had a farming community so they produced their own vegetables and fruits and meats they had their own maintenance garage they even had their own post office and zip code 
Dang. Yeah. So they were self-sustaining. Weirdly enough, they did have visitation. <laughs> oh. Which to me is like, I don't know, redundant. I guess if you're going to be like, you're not allowed to contact anyone outside the outside of this community. And they're like, but they can come visit you and maybe try not to get tuberculosis while they're here. Now, when they would visit them, they would put the patients in like these plastic tent things like over their bed but still to me like like i said that's redundant if you're gonna tell people well we're locking you into this community we're a self-sustaining community now but you're still bringing people in from outside that, and then sending them back out yeah that that seems like it's asking for trouble like something somebody is getting contaminated like no matter how many precautions you're taking you can't you can't say you're in quarantine and then allow outside people into that quarantine. Right. Just just lock everybody in their house for six months. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what that feels like. I have no idea. I've never experienced that in my life. I know, man. Imagine not being able to go anywhere for months on end. I know. Anyway, this situation was so severe that at this point in time, now, before I say this, I want to mention that at this point of time, people were very closed-minded. They were, there was a lot of racism. Right, because this is the early 1900s, This is the right? early 1900s, right. So, unfortunately. So, this was before civil rights and all of that. Yes. And, uh, Jim Crow was still very alive. And the situation was just not good for people of color or really just any sort of minority group. And Kentucky was one of those states. Kentucky was one of those states. I believe it was the Confederate state in the Civil War. But this case was so severe that at that time, they were treating both people of color and white people in the facilities. They they were giving them the same treatments. They were diagnosing them the same. People of color were welcome at Waverly. So there was, like, no segregation. They are like, yeah, forget all that. No, there wasn't no segregation. There was still segregation. People of color were still put into their own wing. Okay. Oh, I see. Yes. But they were... They weren't, like, giving the treatment. There are pictures of, like, people of color sitting in the waiting room with white people. I gotcha. So it's not like they were, like, treating them lesser and giving them, like, leftovers. They're just like, no, you're sick, too. I mean, there's no, like, you can't really romanticize it. Like, the racism was still there. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. You know, the racism was still there, but this was, common enemy was the tuberculosis. Right, yeah. And I'm sure back then there were probably people upset about having to sit in the waiting room together. Oh, I'm sure. You know, like, stupid stuff like that. But, so, so that's just how severe it was. At this time, unfortunately, though, science is not as advanced, so even though... You know, everybody is getting the same treatment medically. They're not as advanced. Science is not where it is today. So people are kind of new to the idea of microscopic organisms. And we're talking about a period in time where you didn't go through and disinfect your house every week. Right, yeah, because this this was the early 20th century, so we're just entering the modern era. Right. So and all that stuff is new. Right. And the facility would actually, and like schools and things, would actually hang signs around that said, don't chew on your pencils, don't stick your fingers in your mouth, don't spit. If you have to cough, cough into a rag and make sure it's something that can be burned. So, you know, they were they were just now learning about microorganisms and mm-hmm. bacteria and that sort of thing. And as far as like the regular populace went, it's just not something that they considered the same way that we do now right it's kind of wild to think about how like far we've come on that front within just the last hundred years or so. I, I know once it's science crazy. starts going it it just gets faster and faster it seems like i mean even like what 20 years ago you didn't have all these freaking ais and oh i know yeah <laughs> now like everything can do everything for you mm-hmm. you know your fridge can talk to you <laughs> like to me that's weird so again treatment was not that advanced we're going to talk about some of the treatments. Okay. The most common treatments were air, fresh air, okay. rest, nutritious food, competent medical supervision. Okay. 
it was believed that these were the best ways to treat tuberculosis. However, they did have some other more in-depth medical procedures, I guess. They were experimental medical procedures. Uh, I mean, I guess they would have to be because they're trying to cure this thing. Right. Like, how do we get rid of this plague? Right. Trial and error. Uh, So, if you have a weak stomach, I suggest skipping past this part. Trigger warning. It's about to get a little um, painful. Ugh. So well, let's go. I <laughs> let's hear it. I'm ready for the juicy details. <laughs> so we had lobectomies and pneumectomies, lobectomies and pneumectomies. We have lobectomies and pneumectomies, which is when they surgically remove all or part of the infected lung. Okay. Then we have the phrenicotomy. Which is a phrenic nerve crash. Uh, okay. So the nerve supply to the diaphragm is cut off. And after that, dia- the diaphragm remains higher in the chest and is relaxed, which allows a decrease in the volume of the lung due to respiratory diminishment. So they cut your ability to breathe yeah. that much? Yeah. Kind of. Uh, you can't take a deep breath. Well, this does allow healing of the lung, though. It allows the lung to heal. I don't know if it actually does, but that's what the thing said. Right. I mean, I've heard that you can, like, live with only a certain percentage of a your lungs. A portion of your lungs. Yeah. yeah you only like, you use, only like, need... a certain portion of your lungs. Oh, yeah. I'm, like, I knew somebody who was surviving on 10% of their lungs. Well, you only use, like, 10% of your lungs. So you really don't use that much of your lungs. But another really, really common treatment was heliotherapy or sun treatment. Hmm. And they believed that the sun would kill the bacteria. Interesting theory. Right. So they would place people. I'm sure you've seen the pictures. There will be people just sitting in this room that's made of windows. It's like a a, a sunroom. Uh-huh. And they would just sit there for hours in the sun. Okay, now that sounds that sounds peaceful, but I don't think it's going to stop you from dying. I don't feel like it would be peaceful if you were in a room with, like, a million other no, coughing. No, hacking. you're right. You're right. That was one of the more common treatments. Then we have thoracoplast- thoracoplasty. The heck's that? So that is a... Surgically removed. <laughs> it's when they remove your ribs. Okay. Why? <laughs> they do it to purposely collapse your lung. Why? And they usually only removed about two or three, but sometimes they would remove between seven to ten. Oh my god, how many ribs does a person have? Twelve? I don't know. Ugh. But they would remove your ribs to collapse your lung. That sounds painful. Yes, it does. But I guess some people, it helps some people, I guess. I don't even have words. Like, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to breathe right. Like, you body well, hurt. you're already not breathing right. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you just add, like, excruciating pain to that. Well, you know. You'd sometimes. be like, yeah, this is great. Maybe because you're in so much agonizing pain, you can't, It's, it's you don't realize how horrible it is. It's <laughs> like when you tell your dad. My stomach hurts, and he says, "Come here, and I'll step on your foot, and you'll forget about your, you'll forget about your stomach." Yeah. <laughs> okay, like that's what this is. I guess I don't know. I'm just kidding. I don't mean that, but yeah, that's that's I, I don't see how that that seems that seems counter. Well, Lindsay can't even English. She's I like, no, no, <laughs> because I'm so like baffled by that being like like yeah, this will cure you. Let me just make your lungs <laughs> collapse. It gets it gets better <laughs> or worse. Depending on, you know, how you want to look at it. So for those who could not do the thoroplasty surgical removal, they could have artificial pneumothorax. What? What? You have to English for me. (laughs) Basically, that would be introducing air into the pleural cavity. Um. That also doesn't sound fun. You know how it, you feel when you get air trapped in your chest? Yeah. Yeah, that, but all the time. 
<laughs> and if they can't do that, then they'll do postural rest, where you lay on the affected side to help rest the lungs. So the whole concept here is to try and rest the infected lung. Okay. Okay. That's what all of these treatments seek to do. Um, to, to me, the most sensible one sounds like just removing part of the lung that's well, there's like more. infected. There's, like just cut it out. Don't, don't make a decision yet. We got uh, like two more. There's more? How much more body mutilation can we go through? <laughs> I mean, one person is not getting all of this. <laughs> I sure hope not. They're not livid if they are. You don't have that many lungs. <laughs> uh, so there's one. Another procedure that they had was called the shot bag. I don't know what a shot bag is, but they, that it, that's not important. You understand the concept here. So what they would do is they would place a bag on each collarbone. And the bag was about a pound. Okay, this is on the outside of the body? On the outside of the okay. body, yeah. A pound of what? What was in the bag? I, I guess like liquid, just like water. I don't know. But every week, they would put another pound into the bag. They would put a shot into the bag uh, until it was about five pounds on each lung. Doesn't it only take seven pounds to break those bones? I mean, it takes about seven pounds to break a bone, but it's seven pounds of like... Of like applied force. Applied force. Hmm. So this was used to teach correct breathing. Gotcha. I don't really know what that means. I guess like to control your breathing. I, I don't know. Because it, it'd be harder to breathe with something on your chest. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Because, like, okay, as someone who has asthma, I don't like having things on my chest when I can't breathe. I don't like it when the cats lay on me. I don't like it when the dogs lay on my chest when I can't breathe, you know, when I'm having a hard time breathing. So yeah. I, I just, I don't know. I don't know, like, what they believe that accomplished. But, again, they didn't have the science back then that we do now. So... They were just taking stabs in the dark. It ba- basically, yeah. Like, well, that didn't work. Well, and I th- try this. I think this was before. So, you know, there's like a set of moral laws that they actually have to follow in the scientific community for psychology and for like medical examinations. And I don't think that those had been established just yet. I was going to say they weren't as tight because this is around the same time that asylums were a thing. And you know what they used to do there? Yeah. I wish you could have seen her sip her coffee. She said, you know what they used to do there? And she lifted it and like puckered her lips out and looked at me out of the corner of her eye. But anyway, the uh, another treatment that they would do is they would put little balloons in your lungs <gasps> to stretch the lungs out. Yeah, to help you breathe. Oh, that sounds awful. You know what's interesting? This is kind of a side note. But they actually like did this surgery for a while. Where, like, when they would work on your brain, they would, like, put a balloon in the brain. Have you heard of that? No. Yeah. Well, I don't know if they still do it or not, but my grandfather on my father's side was the first person that they did that surgery on. He was the very first person they ever did, did that on. And um, it was, like, he had seizures and stuff, and they put a balloon in his brain. And that's what that makes me think of. So, yeah. Now you know. Wow. <laughs> I don't. I Okay. The last treatment that I have here, I know this is an extensive list, guys. There, There is a lot. But the last thing I have here is they would put, because of the fresh air, mm-hmm. they would actually put the patient's beds outside and have them sleep outside. Okay. In the snow sometimes. What? <laughs> yeah, so fresh air. Okay. Freeze to death. Maybe. Less beds to fill if they're frozen. Lindsay? <laughs> okay. So yeah, yeah, I guess you twisted dark little goblin woman. <laughs> I'm hilarious. You said ridiculous wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Uh so allegedly 63,000 people died, but uh more accurately 8,212 people died. Holy shit. I mean, yeah, that's still a lot of people, but it wasn't 63,000. So if you read that, a lot of, a lot of like the, uh, ghost websites will mm-hmm. say it was like 63,000 people. Maybe world or, uh, nationwide. Right. Maybe. I don't know. But like a lot of ghost websites for Waverly say 63,000 people died in Waverly. And that's it, it just, just not true. It just sounds, it just sounds better. 
Sounds right. Spookier. Like it sounds better. And that's the thing is I encourage you. I, I don't know why, why you would say that. I mean, it does sound scarier, but like 8,000 is still a big number for one building. It is. And the thing is, if you're going to investigate these haunted places, really do your research because it's not helping the community that believes in these things and who's trying to prove them when you embellish these things and <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It always doesn't... always fact check, especially if you're uh going to check out some place that is supposedly haunted or has history. Like it's the same deal like for like Dracula, like you right. heard. There's a lot there's a lot behind it and you, you just gotta check the facts. And so. as as we go down, like, as I talk about Waverly's history, I'm going to mention a few more things that have been embellished, mm -hmm. and I will correct them. But, like, so, guys, anything that you hear about these places, fact check them. Really do your research, because, again, embellishing these things does not help the paranormal community. If you are a part of the, if you are a part of the paranormal community and you're embellishing these things, you're not doing us any favors. And I'm not saying that to be crummy. I just, if we want to prove this, then we need to be factual. We need to know right. what we're talking about. Right. We need to come to the table as a knowledgeable source and not like someone who's just going to say, you know, whatever. Don't be a paranormal tourist. Exactly. Don't be a paranormal tourist. So anyway, 8,212 people died. Underneath Waverly, there is a 500 foot tunnel. Have you heard of this tunnel? Um, No. I'm sure many of you have, but Lindsay has not, so this reaction is going to be golden. I already know it. Uh, this tunnel was used to transport materials in and out of the building. Okay. It... Was it used to move bodies? Yes. Okay. They eventually used it to start moving bodies mm -hmm. at the peak of the tuberculosis that's, outbreak. That's not the first time I've heard that about this disease. But this tunnel wasn't made to move bodies, okay? Okay. And it sounds dark. But the reason that they were using that tunnel was because they didn't want to scare other patients. It was a way to transport the amount of bodies out of the building without right. scaring the other patients. Because they had about one person dying every 24 hours. Yeah, you don't want to... Or, I'm sorry, one person dying per hour. Ooh, geez. Per hour? That makes it so much worse. Right. So that's why they were using these tunnels, or this tunnel, to move people out of the building. Well, I guess they had to get that number 8,000 somewhere. Right. So eventually so like the, this facility was genuinely trying to help people okay they had some practices that were like eh, but they weren't like happily torturing patients <laughs> okay that's not right. what was happening waverly was considered to be one of the top tuberculosis hospitals of its time okay okay eventually though streptomycin which is an antibiotic to treat tuberculosis was developed in 1943 Dang, that is quite some time later. It is. Uh, but it wasn't even available to the patients until six years later. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. So as the years passed, they were eventually able to output patients and cure them, you know, until Waverly closed in 1961. Dang, it was open for for a long time. Well, then it reopened a year later under the name of Woodhaven Geriatric Center. What's a geriatrics center? It's basically for older people, for, for geriatric people. I don't know what that word means. You're so cute. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically, it's just, it's old, like Bowser would have been geriatric dog. Uh, like people who can't get around on their own? Yeah, like they need help. You know what okay, I mean? Okay, so like a an assisted living deal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, a lot of these patients had mobility issues or dementia, or they had some sort of mental handicap. Okay, so yeah, assisted living. Right. However, this is where we get into questionable treatments. Uh -oh. I mean, the, the treatments for the tuberculosis hospital were questionable, but they were trying. Okay. Yeah, they were doing their best. That these, they could. these guys were just assholes. Oh, no. Okay. Don't tell me they mistreated the patients there. Well, so not all patients. Patients? Residents? What's the right word for that? Patients. Okay. Okay. So not all patients were geriatric. Okay. Um, There was actually, there were actually children there, too. Interesting. Okay. I'm going to tell you a story. Okay. I don't have a lot on the treatments that they use because I couldn't find a lot on the treatments that they use. 
but we do know that they used electroshock therapy. <gasps> what? That's evil. Well, it's still used today, actually. Ah. Yes, it is. But it's got, there's some, they tightened up on how it's done now, how it's done now. But back then, you know, they didn't. So I have a story here, and I don't know if this story is true or not. I actually got this story from another podcast okay, called Hillbilly Horror. <laughs> I like that. Oh, my God. They're so fun. Like, they're so fun. You're going to have to sit down and listen to them with me. Now, so I don't know if this story is true or not. I don't know where they got it. I tried to find it online. I couldn't find it. The only thing I did find was, like, I don't know. Are they local to the area? They're in Tennessee. Okay, so local-ish. Yeah, they're, they're nearby. They're nearby. Yeah. They're actually in Nashville. Oh, wow. I'm okay. not trying to give their location yeah. up or anything, but they, they announced that on their podcast. Oh, yeah. So not I assume that, it's Not fine. that far away, so... And maybe it's just, like, some... Maybe they, visit, they visited, you know, the place. They and, were talking about visiting. One of, one of the guys was like, I am never going there. My wife's always, like, wanting to take me there. And I'm like, are you crazy? Like, I want to go there. I know you say it in every episode. <laughs> But, uh, so yeah, I, don't listen to me in the intro because that me is not the real me. I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> that was her doppelganger, uh, which we'll get into that in this too. But anyway, <laughs> so all, all right, yeah, go on with these. She's like, now I got to know about the doppelganger. But anyway, so this young boy, Richard, uh, he was taken in by, I believe it was two nurses and a doctor. For okay. his electroshock therapy. Mm -hmm. And he was crying. Okay. You Makes know, sense. and the doctor apparently got mad at him uh -oh. and started abusing him. Like physically? Abuse? Yes. To the point where, like, the nurse was even crying. Mm -hmm. And apparently, when they started the therapy, this little boy just, like, glared at him. And there was a darkness that suddenly freaking hit the room. Oh my God. And I'm not going to go into details on this particular entity yet, but this is just an alleged story on how this entity came to be. They believe that Richard may have been an indigo child or a child with, like, clairsentient abilities. And the creeper appeared up in the corner. What the hell is the creeper? I don't know if I like that. <laughs> so, you remember talking about shadow people? Yes. Okay, we'll get to the creeper later. Uh but uh, he may have created the creeper. That That is one story on what it might be. There's another theory, which we will get into later. I don't know if this story is true. This sounds more like urban legend to me. I would say that the theory that I present to you later is more realistic. Okay. But this is a story that is presented. With that, we're going to go ahead and start talking about our hauntings. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> that was spooky excitement. Let's go. <laughs> that was spooky excitement. Oh my god. That that's gonna be a new coined term on the show, spooky excitement. <laughs> so You're welcome. And oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We have a little bit more history. I don't even know why. Boo! It's it's so like <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I actually don't mind listening to the history of these places. Well, this history is... I don't understand why this is relevant, but it gets brought up a lot. In 1996, there was a guy, I didn't get his name, but apparently he wanted to build a giant Jesus there. Oh, like a statue? Yeah. He wanted it to be bigger than the giant Jesus in the Rio Grande, which is apparently the largest. Oh, Jesus my statue. God. That is huge. Do you know about that statue? Yes. It, I don't know I've about that. I've seen pictures statue. of it. That, that, yeah. I, to put it simply, you you know the Touchdown Jesus statue. Yeah. It, like, that's like a dwarf compared to how big okay. that. Because you can see that one from far away, and it's on top of, like, a hill or something. Oh, God. Or a mountain. Wow. Yeah, it's massive. Well, okay. So this guy wanted to build something bigger than that, but he couldn't raise the money. It was like $4 million, which to be honest with you, I'm a little surprised he couldn't raise the money because um, Louisville is there by the Bible Belt. I don't know if it's in the Bible Belt or not, but I know it's by the Bible Belt. So that's a little surprising to me. But anyway, now we'll get into the hauntings. Yee. I just brought that up as a tradition because everybody who talks about Waverly brings up giant Jesus. So, one of the things that is commonly seen is at the bottom of the death chute, 
they will people will see a Pierce and it's usually dropping on dropping coffins off. Uh, what? <laughs> they just see a hearse there? Yeah. What? Dropping it, coffins. Is it a ghostly hearse? Like it's not really there? Yeah. It's a it's a haunting. What what the what? That is so I've never heard of like a ghost car. Well, no, I have. You've heard of like ghost, ghost trains? Yeah, I guess. Or like, or like, so dri- it's probably like driving down a highway and a nice car shows yeah, up behind you. But this, I don't think, is intelligent. I think this is probably residual. Those are intelligent, but I think this is probably residual. Yeah, something. Yeah, because it happens so much, so often. Yes, it's just happening forever yeah. and repeat now. So another thing that people often see near the kitchen, they don't know if it's a doctor or not, or a chef. Mm-hmm. I think it's a chef, but it's a man in a white coat. He's usually near the kitchen, and usually, like, the smell of sweet bread is carrying Aww. through the air when you see him. I know, that's like that seems like a nice haunting. Yeah, right? I'd be sorely disappointed that there was no sweet bread, though. Right, can you bring me some sweet bread, Mr. Chef? Uh, another haunting that is commonly seen is... Is this the creeper thing? No, we're not there yet. Dang we're we're okay. saving that for last. All right. So, a lot of people report seeing... Uh, eyeless people? No! (laughs) (laughs) Just people with like... No! (laughs) People with (laughs) holes where their eyes should be. (laughs) I hate that. I want to (laughs) go. Like, you want to go away or you want to go to Waverly? Yeah. Yeah, both? Yeah, I want to go there. I want to see if and then I can. I want to run away. I want to see if I could see him, so that way I could be thoroughly creeped out. Um, another <laughs> thing that people see. So you know what a doppelganger is? Sort of. A doppelganger is basically like you. So you see yourself. Yeah, that'd be like if I got up to go into the kitchen and you were standing in there, but you were just sitting across from me. I'd be like, wait a second. Right. Now the thing about doppelgangers is they say that you don't want to see your own doppelganger because it's a death omen. Yikes. But a lot of people say that they will see their doppelganger at Waverly. I hate that. And if their doppelganger also does not have eyes. <gasps> oh. <laughs> Which says to me that it's not really a doppelganger. It's probably like something mimicking. Yeah, that's not better. Yeah, because they'll see like these entities without without eyes and then they'll see like themselves without eyes so to me that's not a doppelganger you know but whatever i could be wrong i don't know Mm. i never want to see my doppelganger doppelganger if you're not listening or i mean well if you are listening stay put isn't there a spider-man character named doppelganger i think so or a comic book something okay the doppelganger hold on i gotta look Okay. And we're back! There is a doppelganger character on Spider-Man, and it's Spider-Man with eight legs and sharp teeth. Oh, I hate it. Yeah, me too. But anyway. (laughs) so That's worse than Carnage. (laughs) I don't know about that. Uh, Visually. Uh, I don't know about that. (laughs) Carnage is pretty disturbing. You're just saying that because of all the Carnage Carnage causes. I don't like the way Carnage looks. He's slimy. <laughs> Y'all go look and let us know who's more disgusting, Spider-Man doppelganger or Carnage. Anyway, <laughs> back on track here. So, yeah, uh, people will see their doppelgangers. Additionally, there is a young ghost there. Okay. His name is Timmy. Does he have eyes? He has eyes. Okay. <laughs> His name is Timmy. And Timmy used to be friends with one of the nurses. Like, she loved him. Okay. Okay. And she would play ball with him. All right. Well, now, if you go to Waverly and you take a ball with you, Mm -hmm. then and you set it in this area, it'll roll around. It'll roll from side to side. Like, he'll play with you. Sometimes balls will roll out of nowhere. Okay. Okay. And, like, if you ask him to roll the ball, like... Like I said, it'll roll, like, just from side to side. It doesn't always just roll. Because, you know, I mean, the building has settled, so I'm sure it's not all level. Right. You know, I'm sure that there's drafts coming in. But sometimes it just kind of back and forth. I mean, at this point, the building's like 100 years old. Right. So another apparition that is often reported is a woman. 
who has bloody wrists. They believe it's from the shackles that she may have wore. She may have been a dementia patient. Oh my god, they put him in shackles? I, I guess. And she will howl for help, and she runs away from people who try to approach her to help her. Ah, uh, that was one of those people that you said probably lived there and was treated badly. Right. All right, so before we get into the creeper, I want to talk about the fifth floor. The fifth floor? I thought I only had four. No, it has five. I said it had five. Duh. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the fifth floor is allegedly the floor that they would always place the most disturbed patients on. Like after it was, after it was a place yeah. for... After it was a tuberculosis hospital. Right, assisted living place. Yes. Yeah. Um, supposedly in room 502, two nurses killed themselves. Oh my god. One hung herself oh. and the other one jumped from the window. <gasps> now, this is where I'm talking. Like, this is... We're touching back on embellishments now. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is commonly stated. It's talked about on ghost shows. Mm -hmm. It's talked about on haunting sites. Yes. None of it happened. Okay. Okay. No nurse threw herself out the window. And there aren't even beams or there's nothing for anyone to hang themselves from. Okay. Okay. Additionally, patients were allowed to free roam throughout the entire hospital. They were not subjected to stay on one floor. Gotcha. Okay. So this is what I'm saying. And a lot of these sites I was jumping back and forth through, and I always found that the haunting sites would give the scarier version of what happened, and these historical sites, or documentaries, or videos, mm -hmm. would give actual events. Yeah. Okay? So, again, to be clear, the fifth floor was not the area that they kept the most disturbed patients in. It was not, and room 502... No one killed themselves in room 502. Okay. No one was shoved out the window. No one hung themselves. None of that actually happened. Okay. Now, we are at the the moment you've all been waiting for. The creeper. Yes. So, the creeper mm -hmm. we discussed earlier was allegedly created by this young clairsentient Richard. Yes. Okay. Some other theories on the creeper before I tell you what it does. Okay. Are that maybe it's just a shadow person. One of those crawlers. It's a crawler? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes and no. We'll get there. I don't like that. Another theory is that it was a patient who was mistreated and who was very disturbed. And it was mistreated so poor or so much that it remains uh, as this dark entity. That's worse. Yes. So the creeper doesn't really crawl. It's like it doesn't have its legs, and it drags itself around. Oh no! 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 Uh! -uh. <laughs> that's worse. It I'd is. rather it crawled. <laughs> the fact that it doesn't have legs. No. Additionally, it drags itself up the walls. Oh my god. And on the ceiling. Oh no! It has been known to invoke a sense of dread in people. It's invoking a dread in sense of me! <laughs> you didn't even English! I didn't care! You said it's... What did you say? It's invoking a sense of dread in me! That is definitely not what you said. But, uh... Yes, so like when it's around, people feel a sense of dread. This entity has said to be able to grab on people. Uh-uh. It has allegedly grabbed on two people's ankles. <gasps> yeah. And again, people believe that this was a mistreated patient. You can actually... So I didn't look... If I can find any, I will post them. But supposedly there are pictures where you can see this thing very easily. Oh, man. So I will see if I can find any. In other words, if you've been there and you've caught pictures of it, please do send those over. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay, always trying to get people to send stuff to us. Yes, do it. So, yes. That 
his Waverly Hills Sanitarium. I challenge you, listeners, to creep me out with your stories and your photos. Of Waverly. Yes. And everything else. Yes. So, let's discuss this. Okay. Give me your thoughts. Uh, on which part? Any of it. Just, just what do you think? Um, I am curious to know what they could have done to these people that lived there that th- this thing. During the time that it was like geriatric? Yeah. yeah that this too. thing was just like crawling around like it's like a she looked like she was gonna vomit when she said crawl <laughs> yeah because i'm just picturing this like ghostly shadow like just like ragging itself around like something out of the creepy pasta like yeah <laughs> yeah like it's just <laughs> and you can almost hear its body just scraping the ground as i it's can't going. wait until we are doing so good that we have like a studio and cameras so that you guys can see Lindsay <laughs> in action <laughs> when she's talking. Oh god. Yeah. So on a scale, starting with the adorably spooky and going up through the truly disturbing, how would you rate this? This is definitely a uh, truly disturbing for me. We have so many truly disturbings. I but this is definitely truly disturbing. Yeah. It's the now, like I said before, I know that they tried. Like, you know that they tried early on, they were doing their best. Right. But, like you said, I am very interested in the geriatric aspect of it. I would like to know what happened, but I had a, I had kind of a hard time finding my, even on the historical pages, I was having a hard time <laughs> finding we information. We don't talk about that. Yeah, right. We don't talk about that. It didn't happen. Yeah. So if you guys know where we can get that information, or you know of a thing. Or if you've heard stories yourself about how they treat them patients. Yeah, let us know. Let us know. I think it starts to get truly disturbing, though, once they... I think I think at one point this was a state-of-the-art facility for its time. And um, then it just kind of yeah. plummeted. And I don't think it actually shut down until, like, 1980. So yeah, that makes that falls in line when every one of those other types of hospitals were shut down for inhumane practices. Is it not creepy to think that was only like a decade before we were born? Yeah, it is. It's horrifying to think that uh, with technology coming along that far, there were still places like this, like on asylums that existed that were treating people like they weren't people. Yeah, it is. It's really sad. I don't know that. But- Hopefully one day, if we ever visit Waverly, we will uh, maybe revisit the history of it and see what we can find that we didn't. Yeah, just do time. like a little update on some of the stuff that we hear, see. Yeah, I think that that would be cool. But mm-hmm. yeah, so you guys. Let would it be an episode on Listener's Library, perhaps? You know, if we can get some. Some listeners, listeners to stories. add to the library. <laughs> She's here for to be entertaining. I'm just here to be entertained. <laughs> so I'll be here all week. Only because she has to be. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was Waverly Sanitarium. Guys, let us know what you think about it. Let us know what you th- where you think it sits on this scale of screams. We'll actually post a scale of screams for you as soon as I can uh, find someone to draw it for me. Because I don't. I, I do draw, but I don't enjoy doing it for. Yeah. Yes. But I'm going to get someone to draw the scale of screams and then uh, maybe I'd like to find a way to be able to start getting what like your guys' ratings on things. Message us. Let us know what you guys think about this. Let us know what your where you believe it sits on the scale of screams. I would like to eventually set something up so that we can get your guys' ratings on these things where you can interact with us and let us know where these things fall on the scale of screams in your mind. Hmm. If you enjoyed this episode of Macabre at Midnight and you like spooky things, you can catch us wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also help us out by liking, rating, and subscribing. We are always looking to improve, and we want to hear what you guys have to say. You can also follow us on Instagram, X, and TikTok for your updates. And you should be able to find those links in our biography. I know that they weren't there and that I mentioned that they were, but they're finally there now, guys. I promise. If you want to hear us talk about something that fits on the scale of screams, or you have an experience or short work of your own horror fiction that you'd like us to share in our new listener library, 
then just email us at macabre at midnight at outlook.com. That's macabre, M-A-C-A-B. And remember to lock your doors, sprinkle a little bit of salt in the carpet, check under your bed, stay spooky, and we will see you in your nightmares. Remember to get plenty of fresh air and watch out for things that can crawl around and grab your ankles. <laughs>